I want to read from Matthew chapter 11, and if you have your Bibles, if you want to grab them, if not, I'll put the scripture up so you can see it. Matthew chapter 11, verse number 28 and verse number 29. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Of course, these are among some of Jesus' most famous words. The scripture tells us that it's out of the heart, the abundance of the heart, the overflow of the heart that the mouth actually speaks. Therefore, that tells me what Jesus, by what Jesus is saying here, Jesus' heart clearly overflows with compassion for people that are worn out and weighed down. Jesus loves people. Jesus loves you far more than you'll ever be able to get your mind around. And out of the abundance of his heart, Jesus spoke these words, you who are weighed down, you who are weary, come to me, I'll give you rest. To those who were wearied by their efforts to keep the law, to those who were who are weighed down in their, in their work to obtain righteousness apart from grace. Christ Jesus, he calls out here, come to me and I will give you what you're looking for, what you're longing for. However, verse 28 is really not the verse that was playing over and over in my mind Tuesday night. And it's not the verse I'm concerned with this morning. There's one word in verse 29 that I want us to focus on. Now again, we want to take the whole text in its context. But there's one verse that I really want us, one word in verse 29 that I really want us to focus on. Jesus said, notice to those who are listening, take my yoke upon you. I want to focus on this word yoke. What lessons can be learned from Jesus' command to come and take his yoke on our shoulders? What is, what's Jesus trying to say through this idea of a yoke? Number one, this morning, I want you to see that number one, yoke, the yoke is a picture. Look again at Jesus' words. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Now, Jesus used a common item of the day to illustrate the truth that he's trying to communicate here. He takes this yoke, this harness. The, the yoke was a, a wooden harness, of course, placed over the neck and the shoulders of a team of oxen or, or a donkey or a horse. That yoke would enable them to pull and to plow some piece of equipment uh, through the field. Whoever held, now I want you to think about this, whoever held the reins to the harness held control over the harness. So the beast in the yoke simply did as it was directed. Maybe I can put it this way. The farmer drives the ox, not the other way around. The one in the yoke would have been one who was directed and one who was driven by the one who holds the reins. Therefore, I think what Jesus is communicating here, the yoke is emblematic of submission and surrender. Notice Jesus did not say, take a yoke or even the yoke upon you. Jesus specifically says, take my yoke on your shoulders. It's important to ask, who's Christ talking to in verse 29? Well, the simple answer is he's talking to you. Every single person that's listening, every single person that's watching right now, Jesus is speaking to you when he says, take my yoke upon you. The implied subject of the sentence here is you. All of you who hear the call, he now says, heed the command. Don't just come to me. He says, not only come to me and find rest. He says, not only come to me, but he gives this command, take my yoke upon you. The call extends to every man of every age who hears it. The call is, come to me. The command is, take my yoke upon you. His call to you, I want you to understand this, Jesus' call to you is first a call to come and get, but second, Jesus' call is a call to stay and to give. In verse 28, Jesus calls us to come and receive something only he can offer. But in verse 29, however, Jesus commands us to come and surrender something that only we can offer ourselves. There's this big question that hangs in the mind of really of everyone, I think. The question is, what does God want from me? And I can answer that question very, I think, accurately and simply this morning. What God wants from you is you. All of you. 
And I'm convinced, and I've seen this in my own heart, my own life, I'm convinced that many of us who have answered the call of verse 28 have never obeyed the command of verse 29. And that's because the first is a call to salvation, but the second is a call to surrender. 28 deals with deliverance. 29 demands devotion. 28 is getting. 29 is giving. What tends to happen in, in the life of many believers and even true believers, we celebrate his sacrifice, but we cringe at the very idea of our own sacrifice. Jesus spoke these words in this particular order for, for a very specific reason. No, no, think about this. Without first heeding the call, without first coming to him, finding salvation in him, without first heeding the call, obeying the command is impossible. But at the same time, without obeying the command, the promise of the call will remain incomplete. Without first seeing Christ as Savior, there can be, there will be no submission to Him as Lord. Unless the Holy Spirit does that work of, of regeneration and opens our eyes to the, the saving work of Jesus Christ in this flesh, we cannot surrender to Him. But when he, is, when he has done that work and we've answered the call to come to him, there is a, a second aspect, a second part of that work, and it's not just to heed that call, but to obey that command, not just to come to him, but to come and give all of yourself to him. Without first seeing Christ as Savior, there can be no submission to him as Lord, but without coming to him as Lord, we will never experience the full power and the sweetness, will never taste the sweetness of Jesus' office as Savior. Unless you wholeheartedly, unconditionally submit to Jesus as Lord, you will never taste the full sweetness of his office as Savior. There's a question, can a man go to heaven unsurrendered? And I think the answer to that is yes. But will an unsurrendered man ever experience heaven on earth? And the answer to that is a, is a resounding no. I, I find it in my own heart. I've, I've, I've had to repent of this constantly myself, and I'm sure there's others who have to repent of this as you're listening as well. You, you've answered the call to come unto him, but you've not answered the call to take the yoke upon you, to submit, to surrender wholeheartedly to Him. And to those of you who are in that condition, I just, I just want you to hear my heart this morning, but more importantly, hear the heart of Jesus. Yes, you've come to Him, but you've not answered this command. You've not obeyed this command to surrender. You will never know the full rest that He promised. You will not taste the sweetness of His office of, as Savior until you have submitted to Him as Lord. Jesus is calling everyone listening. I don't care where you're at. I don't, I don't care what you're doing at this moment. Jesus is calling you to take his yoke on your shoulders. And let there be no doubt that means he commands you to submit yourself and surrender your will wholly to his. Surrender is, is never a thing that happens to us. Surrender is a choice that we consciously make. Surrender is, a, is an action we take. Notice Jesus says, you, you do it. You take the yoke. You surrender. You submit. Just as Jesus called us to take up the cross and follow him, he's commanded those who would be with him to take on his yoke and to surrender completely to him. Let there be no doubt Christ is calling all who hear this word to unconditional, absolute surrender to his lordship. In all things, there is only one right way, and that way is his way. We can no more set the terms of our surrender than can the ox negotiate the terms of his service. The only way to come to Jesus is with a white flag of complete surrender. No terms, no conditions, just Jesus, I give absolutely all of myself up to you. My dreams, my hopes, my plans, my, my desires, what I want to do today, what I want to do tomorrow, how I want to invest my time, my energy, how I want to invest my finances. Lord, I surrender everything to you and to your absolute sovereign control. One may ask, why should, I, why should I heed this command? 
And I think the greatest reason to heed the command is because of the call. The mere fact that Jesus offers salvation is itself the greatest reason for submission. Look, he, he didn't die for us when we were good people. It was while we were yet sinners, while we were yet uh, far from God, while we were enemies of God, while we harbored hatred in our heart towards God, while we were in active rebellion. At the very moment we were disobeying, Jesus died for us. Because he answered, because he offers this call, the mere fact that he offers salvation is the greatest reason for submission. His deliverance is the only justification needed for our devotion. If I offered you nothing else today, if I only told you that Jesus saves, that is enough reason for you to be submitted and surrendered to him. How can we refuse to give ourselves to him when he's given himself for us? How, how can I say you can't have all of me when he said, I'll give you all of me? The picture of the yoke is meant to illustrate unconditional surrender to his will and, and complete submission to his lordship. Taking his yoke on you is saying, Jesus, you own the yoke, you have the reins, you're in control, I completely surrender to you. Number one, this yoke that Jesus is talking about, number one, the yoke is a picture. Number two, I want you to see the yoke has a purpose, and this is really where the truth gets sweet. Now, of course, the yoke has many purposes, but its chief end is revealed in the text. According to verse 29, the purpose of the yoke is actually, get this, not laboring, but learning. Look again at what Jesus said. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you, and then what did he say? and learn of me, or learn from me. It may surprise you to learn that the primary purpose of Jesus' yoke is not to accomplish something through you. Jesus' primary purpose is to accomplish something in you. When we read the word yoke, we can't help but imagine pulling and plowing. We see an ox exerting all of his strength the mere idea of a harness automatically makes us think of what we need to be doing for God. When people read this verse, they think, okay, God is calling me to get active, to, to serve, to be busy, to do something. The mere idea of a harness automatically makes us think of what we need to be doing for God when God is actually trying to show us here what he wants to do for us. We tend to think Jesus is calling us to go and do something for him when in reality in this text, he is calling us to come and allow him to do something for us. Again, the yoke is not meant to emphasize service. It's meant to emphasize surrender. Now, someone should be curious. Every believer should be asking, if this is not about what we're to do for him, then what exactly is it that he wants to do for us? What is it I'm driving at here that, that Jesus wants to do for you? Let Jesus answer that question. What did he say? He said, take my yoke upon you and learn from or of me. What does Jesus want to do for you? Uh, we already asked the question, what does Jesus want from you? And the answer to that is all of you. But what does Jesus want to do for you? What Jesus wants to do for you is to give you all of himself. When he says, learn of me, that tells me that Jesus wants to, more than you want it, Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. He wants to put his glory on full display before you. Jesus wants you to know him more than you want to know him. His desire, God's overwhelming desire for you, is that you know him fully. And taking the yoke is actually the most expedient way for this to happen. Remember in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 3, the scripture says, Isaiah said that the ox knows his master's crib. The, or the ox knows his owner, rather. Those words, the ox knows his owner. The ox literally learns his master's voice. He, he enters into almost some sort of relationship with the master. However, the ox does not become familiar with his master wandering around in the pasture. The ox doesn't become familiar. He doesn't get to know his master doing as he pleases. No, the ox learns the master's voice. The, the ox gets to know the master in the harness. 
And it's the same with us. It's in the harness that we not only learn from Him, it's in the harness that we really learn of Christ. A full knowledge of Jesus can only be gained in submission to Him because in a unique way, the harness puts Jesus' disposition on display. What did Jesus say? He said, come to me. And he said, take my yoke upon you. He said, learn of me. And then what did he say you're going to find? Learn of me. For he said, I am meek and lowly. I'm gentle and I'm humble. Gentle and lowly. See, it's in the yoke that we really learn this, that we really discover this, that we experience what it means that Jesus is gentle and lowly. Some masters are hard, some masters are cruel, but not Jesus. No one has ever surrendered to God. No one has ever waved the white flag in front of God. No one has ever surrendered to God and been abused by Him. Those who take the yoke discover that Jesus doesn't drive from behind. Jesus leads from ahead. I want you to get this picture in your mind. Not of Jesus. And see, this is what we think. This is why so many hesitate at surrender. We think surrender is, is me giving myself to him. I get in the yoke and then he's behind me with a whip driving me as hard as he can. But that's not at all who Jesus is. Uh, Jesus won't even quench a, 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 a smoky flies, right? He won't, he won't break. He won't destroy a reed that's already broken. That, that's not who Jesus is. Jesus is gentle. We get this idea, we're so afraid to surrender because we think of Jesus behind us with a whip, just lashing us, driving us as hard as he can. But those who take the yoke discover that Jesus doesn't drive from behind. He leads from ahead. Get the picture in your mind of a, of a farmer instead of behind the oxen with the, with the reins and with the whip lashing them. Get the picture in your mind of, of the farmer walking ahead, leading, leading the cows, leading the oxen as they're in the harness. And that's more what submission to Jesus actually looks like. He doesn't drive from behind. He leads from ahead. He doesn't beat his servants. In fact, he's the only owner that was beaten for his servants. Jesus doesn't leave marks on us, even though we've left marks on him. He doesn't sacrifice the ox. He is the only master who was sacrificed for the ox. It's in the yoke, under submission to Jesus, that we come to understand by experience just how gentle, just how kind, just how reasonable that God really is. Though he is the master, he gives, God always gives far more than he takes. He offers more than he asks. He serves those who offer themselves to serve him. <laughs> the one who wanders around in the field without submitting to the yoke will have his needs supplied. Listen, any believer who has truly come to Christ, who's truly in Christ, God will take care of that child of his. Just like an ox who wanders around in the field without submitting to the yoke, he's still going to have his needs supplied. He's even going to hear the master's voice sometimes. He's going to often take, kindness, take notice of the master's kindness. But the ox that's wandering around in the field on his own, yes, he belongs to the master. He's in the field. He's being taken care of by the master. That ox will never fully comprehend, will never fully experience what it is to be loved by the master. If taking his yoke is such a wonderful experience, why is it that so few come under it? Why is it that, that so many of God's people are fine with being in the field? They're fine with him taking care of them. They're fine with him supplying their needs. They, they even like to talk about his kindness every once in a while, but they shudder at the thought of, of surrendering. If taking his yoke is such a wonderful experience, why do so few people come under it? I think one reason is the devil is our enemy. He's a genius. He's peddled the lie that submission is more about giving yourself than it is about gaining him. And not only is the devil a genius in the lies he peddles, but the flesh, the flesh is always about self-preservation. And when the flesh hears the word surrender, it, it literally it runs in fear at the thought of losing control. It, the flesh only thinks of, well, look, if I surrendered him, what I have to give up. But the flesh never considers all that it will gain. The flesh fears what God might ask, but it does not hear what he offers. 
Do you, do you hear in this text, Jesus says, if you'll come, if you'll surrender yourself to me, if you'll come under my yoke, all he asks for is you. But then he says, I will give you myself, you will learn of me, and you'll find rest for your souls. May I say, any fear, some of you are sitting there thinking right now, oh, well, uh, surrender to God sounds good, but I, I'm just afraid. What is God going to ask? What is God going to do? What's he going to demand if I fully surrender to him? Can I say to you, any fear of surrender is an indication of a wrong and a low view of God. Surrendering to Him is not only what's best for you, it will also be and always be what's best to you. Certainly think about this. When the ox is in the harness, he's not free to do what or go where he wants. However, this is not a limitation on the animal. Yes, in the, in the harness, some things may be off limits to him, but a whole new world of opportunity and fruitfulness is open to him through bearing the oak. The ox doesn't have to worry about being fed because that's the master's job. He doesn't have to worry about where to go or which turn to take because his direction is at the master's discretion. Only in the yoke is the ox truly free. The ox finds his greatest fulfillment in the yoke because the yoke is what he was made for. And though, though broken, it's still a beautiful illustration of, of the believer who surrenders wholly to Christ. The one who takes Christ's yoke no longer needs to worry about food and raiment. In the yoke, he's free to concern himself only with hearing and obeying the voice of the Master. The one who has submitted does not need to concern himself with, with direction. The master's hand is on the reins, and he will reveal his direction at his discretion. Now, now, the ox and the believer are different in that the animal was created to plow for the master, but men were created to know the master. The greatest joy of your life will come in knowing Christ. But Christ can only be fully known through the experience of surrender. You see, surrender is not a burden God places on us. Surrender is a blessing He offers to us. Letting go of control and putting control in His hands is not a burden. It's a blessing because it then frees us for what we were made for. Those who fully give themselves to God, they will not lose anything, but they will gain everything. And if you're listening and you are not fully surrendered to Him, may I beg you, don't allow the, the false fear of loss and pain keep you from experiencing the joy and the gain of discovering that He really is gentle and lowly in heart. It's a sad thing because what happens is as long as we persist in non-surrender, we're also going to persist in our wrong views of Him. As long as we view Him as a, as a taker rather than a giver, we'll refuse to surrender. And as long as we refuse to surrender, we'll never have the experience that He is actually a giver rather than a taker. Those who never surrender to Him, never learn of Him, and the whole thing creates a, a continuous vicious cycle of unbelief about the character of God. It's sad, but it's true. Far too many people are so filled with the bitter fear of losing control that they never taste and see that he is good. So many people are so afraid of losing control, they never know the sweetness of letting him be in control. Friends, Jesus never overdrives those who take his yoke. God is not an abusive master. In fact, he, he is the very opposite. He was abused for us, yet we will never enjoy a full understanding. We will never enjoy a full experience of His love until we have completely surrendered to His Lordship. The harness. The harness isn't chiefly about laboring. The harness is chiefly about learning. It's not about what He wants to, you to do for Him. It's about what He wants to do for you. It's not come to me, submit to me, and get to work for me. It's come to me, submit to me, and learn about me, and discover I am gentle, I am meek, I am lowly. Number one, the yoke is a picture. Number two, the yoke has a purpose. Number three, finally, I want you to see that the yoke is productive. 
Now again, though it may seem counterintuitive, the product of the yoke is not primarily rose, but rest. Look one final time at verse 29. Jesus says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And then he says this, What will happen when you come, when you surrender, when you learn of me, when you discover I'm gentle and lowly in heart, he says this, and then, and only then, he says, you will find rest for your souls. Rest is, I was thinking about this morning, rest is when the boat is, is stable and still. The opposite of rest is disturbance. The opposite of, of, of rest is when the boat is reeling and rocking back and forth. You know, I've been on, on the water many times and, and, and the water has been calm and I've been sitting there. My boat's just kind of been slowly drifting across the top of the water. And then a bigger boat comes along and it's going full speed and it stirs up the water. And the water gets all choppy and, and my boat starts to rock back and forth and, and be tossed up and down. That's the difference, the before and after, that's the difference of the person who has rest and the person who doesn't. Rest is, is when the boat is just stable and still. There's a gentle breeze. The, the boat's drifting gently on top of the water. The opposite of that is disturbance. The boat's reeling and rocking, agitated and thrown about, thrown about by, by these choppy and these violent waves. Can I tell you something? If your life is more agitation than relaxation, that is an evidence that you have not fully surrendered to Christ. Now, I'm not saying that those who are surrendered don't have difficulties. What I am saying, though, is difficulties don't have them. Notice Jesus says the product of surrender is what? It's rest. Again, now this is counterintuitive to the flesh. The old man demands, how, how can this be? How can an instrument of labor, the harness, the, the yoke, how can an instrument of labor actually produce rest? And, and the answer is actually really, really simple. Those who surrendered him, we've already seen this progression, those who surrender to him discover him. And those who discover him know that there is no one stronger and no one kinder than him. And, and the two are both necessary. If Jesus was only strong, if he was only powerful, he would be a terror to us. But Jesus is not just all strong and all powerful. He is all kind and all gentle. And in this discovery that he is, he is both knowing that there's no one stronger, but also knowing that there's no one kinder than him, the knowledge that your master is above all things, coupled with this experience that he cares intimately, deeply for you, that brings a stability and a tranquility, even during a hurricane. I mean, the waves can be 10 foot high, but your boat's going to be on an even plane when you realize that he is strong, he is sovereign, he is able, but he's also meek, he's also lowly at heart, and he cares deeply for you. When those two are coupled, when, when in the yoke you have the experience of learning that he doesn't, that he doesn't overdrive, but in other, instead he gets ahead and leads, when you experience that even during a hurricane, your boat can be steady because you know he's strong and able and you know he cares for you. It doesn't matter how high the waves get. If he walks on the water, he can always get to you. It doesn't matter how loud the wind howls, it will lay down and play dead at his command. The one who is surrendered finds rest because the one who has control of me also has control of everything else. What do I need to, to worry about? What do I need to fret about? What do I need to fear about? When the one who has control of the universe also has control of my life. Each phrase of verse 29 is really dependent on the phrase before. Think about this. Taking the yoke precedes learning of his heart. Oh, and again, I can't stress enough, in the yoke you will find out how good his heart is. But taking the yoke precedes learning of his heart. Learning of his heart precedes finding rest for your soul. You see, the rest that Jesus offers is grounded in the revelation he provides. Rest for the soul comes from knowing the heart of God. As we get to know the gentle, the kind, the lowly heart of God, as we get to know that heart, as he reveals that to us in the yoke, we'll find rest for our souls. 
The rest he offers is grounded in the revelation he provides. Rest for the soul comes from knowing the heart of God, and knowing the heart of God comes from our spent in the harness of God. Knowing God's heart is only learned in God's harness. When we learn who he really is, contrary to who we thought he was, it, it brings about just a real relaxation to the soul. And, and think about it, the soul can exhale. The, the soul that has discovered that he is a giver rather than a taker, the soul that has found it to be true that he gives rather than takes, can exhale because he's not the, the overbearing one we thought him to be. The soul that has found rest in Jesus can walk free when it understands that real liberty is found in bondage to Him. You see, the product of submission is rest because in submission we learn who He is, and in learning who He is, we are free to exhale because we know He's good. The product, though, of surrender, yes, is rest, but a byproduct of surrender will then be rose. Just stay with me as I, as I finish here. Now, I said the product of the yoke is not primarily rose, but rest. However, I did not say the yoke would not produce rose. In producing rest first, the harness produces rose second. And we usually get this backward and we're the worst for it. Notice, Jesus only invites men to come. He never encourages them to leave. And what we do, we make the mistake of coming to Jesus for salvation and immediately heading out to the field to, to start plowing and planting and pulling when instead we should remain with Jesus so that he can fit us for the work he has for us to do. See, this is the mistake we make. We get salvation and we automatically rush to service. When instead, when he grants salvation, we should automatically rush to surrender. Now, the unsubmitted mind may hear what I've said and think, well, look, so you're telling me all I have to do is surrender. I don't have to work. I don't have to serve. The unsubmitted mind may hear what I've said and think the yoke frees me from service, but, but I want you to understand that's not true. My friend, the yoke frees you to service. However, our, our work, though, now is not accomplished by human might or strength. Our work is accomplished by the Spirit of God. Pulling and plowing in your own strength will only produce frustration. True productiveness comes not from our work, but from our walk. Now what I mean is this. The one who is in step with the master, the one who is being led by the master, experiencing the master, will inadvertently find himself also being effective for the master. So this is the amazing thing. When he's walking ahead, holding the reins, pulling you along, as he's pulling you along, as he's leading you along, and you're in the harness, you'll be pulling the plow, and the field will get plowed. As we walk with him, learning of him, the field gets plowed, the field gets planted as a byproduct of the fellowship we have with him. You see, when we minister from the overflow of his ministry to us, our ministry will then become fruitful rather than forced. Rather than always trying to do something for him, we will find ourselves accomplishing his will out of an appreciation, out of an overflow of, of the love for what he's done for us. Maybe I, could, maybe I could put it this way. When we come to know him, we will love him. When we love him, we will talk about him with affection rather than just intention. Let me, let me illustrate it this way. I was saying this morning, and the thought occurred to me, my sister told me one time, I don't remember what I said, I don't remember how I said it. It was early on when me and Lindsay had first started dating, and Hannah said something to the effect of, I, I said something about Lindsay, and Hannah, my sister, said, you always talk about her. You bring her up in every conversation. <laughs> and she didn't say it in a in a mean or a hateful way, she was just pointing out that I'm always bringing Lindsay into every conversation. I was thinking about it this morning. The reason that happened was I was in love with Lindsay. And because I was in love with, with Lindsay, it just became so natural. Even if she wasn't there, it became natural that in every conversation, she came into the conversation somehow. See, this, this is what I want you to see here. When you have gotten in the yoke, when you've surrendered and you have found him 
to be so lovely, so good, so kind. When you have fallen in love with him, then rather than always going around trying to intentionally serve him, when you have fallen in love with him out of your affection for him, your service will take place. The product of taking the yoke is not all you will accomplish for him. It's all he will accomplish in you. And the work he accomplishes in you will accomplish his work through you. Again, and maybe I could say it the old cliche way, it's not about being busy. It's about being with him. The product of revelation is first rest. As we come to know him, as we come to understand him, as we discover and experience him, we will find rest for our souls. The product of revelation is rest but the product of rest is rose. As we walk with him, the field will get plowed, the field will get planted, the weeds will get pulled. Friends, Jesus doesn't, now this might surprise you, Jesus really doesn't want, or maybe I should say Jesus doesn't need your service. Jesus primarily doesn't want your service, Jesus wants your surrender. And only when he has the second will the first ever be of any eternal value and effectiveness. Now, in everyone's heart, maybe not everyone, but in many hearts, there's going to be this, this thought, oh, I wish I could fully surrender to him. I really wish I could fully give myself over to him, but I, I don't even think I'm able. My flesh is so strong and my spirit is so weak, I want to be able to surrender to him, but I just... I just feel that, that, that part of my flesh, it's so sneaky and it hides things. And, 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 and I'm, I'm just not sure if I fully could surrender. And even if, even if I tried, there would probably still be that part of me that was unharnessed, unsubmitted. There, there's this battle in some of you right now. I wish I could, but I just can't. And Fred, I just want to say this to you. You're right. When your flesh says you're not able, it's telling the truth. But it's only telling half the truth. You're not able but he is. God always completes the work that he began. Just as you came to him by faith for salvation, I encourage you to come to him by faith for surrender. And what, what I mean by this is, is if you will obey his command, if you will, just like in salvation, you came to him weak and trembling, you came to him by faith, just trusting him to do what you couldn't, you surrendered to to take his, to give up your righteousness and to take his. It's the same with this act of, of submission and surrender. We come to him with our brokenness, we come to him with our completeness, we wave the white flag even in our weakness, and we trust him to do what we can't. I guarantee you, if you will obey his command, if you'll humbly give yourself to him the best that you can, he'll do what you can't. He will conquer those parts of you that remain unsurrendered, unseen. He'll bring perfection from your imperfection. Don't worry about those secret parts of you that, that you're not even aware of or unsurrendered. Don't focus on that. Surrender what you do know. Surrender what you do have. And in time, he will reveal what is unknown and unseen. In time, he will conquer those parts of you that still remain unsurrendered. Don't worry about what might be. I encourage you, surrender what is. Surrender the best you can and trust him to accomplish what you can't. His yoke is not hard. In fact, it's easy. His yoke doesn't add burdens. His yoke takes the burden away. To all who hear Jesus calls, come to me. All you labor and are heavy laden, Jesus says, I will give you rest. But to all who have answered that call, Jesus issues a command, and the command is, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Father, now I pray that you'll take your word, and in the power of your spirit, Minister it to your people. Bring people to absolute surrender today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.